From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 10, recorded Monday, March 13th, 2006. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Automated QA, makers of Test Complete, providing automated testing of Windows, .NET Framework, Java, and web applications, online at www.automatedqa.com. And by peterblum.com. Start with better controls, finish with better sites. Online at p-e-t-e-r-b-l-u-m.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks about functional testing tools and utilities. Hi, this is Carl Franklin. You're listening to Hansel Minutes, show number 10. Of course, I'm here with Scott Hanselman, and this week we're talking testing tools. Right, Scott? We are, specifically uh, web testing tools, testing stuff when you make websites. All right, so basically we have this great sponsor, and we haven't talked about them at all. You know, it's a little weird talking about a sponsor's product because you don't want to seem like, you know, oh, well, you're just kowtowing to the sponsor. But, you know, this is good stuff, and and we took it all for a spin. But you also tried out some other testing tools, so you're going to talk about uh, several, right? Yeah, Automated QA's Test Complete is cool, but I've just thrown it into a pile with a bunch of other web uh, testing tools like Selenium, IE Unit, Bad Boy, PesterCat, Segway Silk Test, Web Recorder from MJTNet. All right. Uh, man, a pile. I mean, there's new stuff coming up from the water team called Firewater. We'll talk about them all. All right, well, let's get started. What's first? Well, so... I'm a web guy mostly, um, and uh, when I think about doing functional testing over the web, uh, from what I can tell, there is a, a number of different classes of, um, of kind of philosophy about how I'm going to do my testing. There's your HTTP-based test tool, right? Mm-hmm. This is the kind that maybe sets up a proxy. They don't really care what browser you use. They set up a local host proxy, and then they listen to the HTTP traffic. Right. And they'll record it. And like then, a snooper. Like a snooper. And then they'll do the TiVo thing, and they'll record and playback. Yeah. And these things are are clever for load testing, right? Because then you can just say, hey, hey that thing you just did, do it a lot, but now have 20 guys do it. Mm-hmm. But for functional testing, it's a little it's a little dodgy because sometimes you want to test JavaScript that you've got in your client side. Uh, sometimes there's complicated interactions that can't really be seen mm-hmm. uh, when you're just looking at the underlying traffic. Okay. So you got your HTTP based recorders. Then you've got JavaScript object model ones. These are ones that say, well, I want to get basically my browser on a string. I want to be a puppet yeah. master, and the JavaScript object model is the best way to do that. Right. Those guys are usually cross-platform, cross-browser, because they're using JavaScript to do the real heavy lifting. Sure. Then you've got your Win32, what I call your Win32 Spy++ type of guys. Yeah. Uh, This is like real similar to the automated QA guys, although they also do HTTP-based traffic. This is where you have a uh, the tree of all of the windows, not the windows in the, uh, hey, look at all the windows in my taskbar sense of things, but in the... This little button is a window and there's a tree of H wins, kind of the win32 way. Yeah. That's really useful because you can do both win forms and web forms testing. And we'll talk about the goods and the bads about that. Now, I know you're not a big Windows programmer per se, but not anymore. Uh, yeah. So, so you're really going to focus on web testing. Right. But I want to just kind of cover the philosophies and, uh, some of these tools sure. do do Windows based testing, which you can still use to test your browser. Oh, okay. So you can actually still do web testing with this philosophy. Okay. Uh, so then you've got your payload based, uh, recorders. These are the ones that kind of look at the HTML page and then poke around in the page using their own object model. Yeah. They'll, sometimes they'll take the HTML and they'll make it look like XML and you'll do, uh, XPath queries on the page. Mm-hmm. And that's how you'll find an object. Others will look at the payload with regular expressions and say, give me the text box called social security number or give me the button called go and Mm -hmm. I'll do something with it. Okay. The main point of classifying these different things is to call out that an HTTP recorder is not a web recorder. Okay. So when someone says, oh, yeah, I'm recording traffic and playing it back, well, What exactly? Are you recording button clicks or are you recording HTTP posts? Hmm. So when you're picking a tool, you should really think about that 
what your what your goal is and whether that tool meets your needs. So are you saying that an HTTP recorder is a server side recorder and a web recorder's client or or what exactly are you saying is the difference between those two? Are you trying to be a puppet master and control the the UI? Yeah. Or are you sitting between the browser and the server and watching what goes by? I see. Yeah, exactly. One is a sniffer, one is a controller. Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. So there's a really huge list of um, QA testing products at shrinkster.com slash CY8. And uh, some of these tools that I picked came from that list. Uh, certainly, I'm sure we've missed someone. I mean, we're only going to talk about a dozen, half a dozen uh, t- uh, tools. But, you know, if your really awesome tool is not on this list, I apologize. But wow, I picked the ones that I could. Okay. This is a big list. Well, yeah, it's hardcore. I mean, there's always someone out there who's got a great tool to do something. But what I wanted to do was pick t- enough tools that cover this uh, these classes that I've come up with. I mean, this is just something I just made up, right? Right. But the, the HTTP-based, JavaScript object-based, window-based, payload-based, those are the kind of the, from where I see at the top level uh, okay. classifications. Sure. Okay. Um, okay, so, so Automated QA... Yeah. Our, our sponsor. Yeah. Uh, has a thing called Test Complete. And, uh, they are, I would say, primarily a Windows application tester. Okay. But, um, so like WinForms applications, I was able to get a recording and playback of like a calculator test mm-hmm. in like 10 minutes. It was pretty easy. You know, cool. you just hook up a test suite, you launch calculator and you start messing with it and they record everything that you do. Because they're primarily com based and they're kind of like Spy Plus Plus. I keep referring to Spy Plus Plus. This mm-hmm. is a tool that comes along with uh, Visual Studio that lets you know the window handle hierarchy of right. the different things. So they have a number of plugins that you can uh, test WinForms applications. You can get into your .NET objects. They also have wrappers for things like NUnit and stuff. So they really intend to be your complete testing suite yeah. for whatever you're doing. So if you've got a bunch of NUnit tests and a WinForms control and you really want to simulate somebody pounding on this thing, doing functional testing, doing load testing, doing whatever, you would use their tool. Now, I know you're primarily a web guy, but um, it, there doesn't seem to be a lot of testing tools out there for Windows applications. Am I right? Not that I see. I mean, there's your big guys like your Silk Test and different ones like that, but uh, they're, they're expensive and it's kind of complicated because when you're going to go poking around at Windows, you have to ask yourself, am I just going to do WinForms? So am I making a .NET application? Right. Or am I going to do any application in Windows that can put out a UI. Mm. So the automated QA guys took the window handle approach, which means that they can test anything. They can test Delphi, they can test C++, MFC. They test finished products. Yeah, from the, from the outside. But they also do what's called white box testing, where if you know your object has some, like your .NET controls have a static method that you want to poke around and call, mm-hmm. you can not only pound on the buttons, but you can also leap inside the application and, and call methods. Neat. So Neat. you can do API level stuff as well. Okay, so their tool is 500 bucks without the web stuff for load testing or 900 bucks for the, the full kind of enterprise edition. Okay. So this kind of prices it outside of the, uh, you know, one or two guy shops unless that shop does, uh, does web testing, does hardcore testing. Right. Uh, initially some of the things that kind of turned me off is that while it has, um, parameter help where you can like see the different, uh, you can see specific help on each parameter. I didn't see a way to turn on IntelliSense. Okay. And I'm kind of an IntelliSense uh, addict, and I'm kind of had a little trouble getting through it. But um, on the web testing side, they take a Windows-based approach. So you basically walk around inside the IE DOM, the IE Document Object Model, and you can look at it two ways. You can look at it via a window, or a, um, they call it a tree approach, and they have a tag approach. But basically, you write script like, you know, document.all.forms.button.click. Okay. Like that. Do they record scripts as well? They do record HTTP traffic. So I was able to, like, load test my blog. Mm -hmm. I brought up a browser. It recorded all the traffic. I clicked around on my blog, and then I simulated five users beating on my blog. That was really easy. So that was doing kind of record and playback because their tool does both HTTP-based window based and javascript object based so they're actually doing kind of three different kinds of testing of the of the classes that i listed out right all in one tool right um but getting the brow getting them to listen to the browser click and do that kind of high level functional testing as from a recorder point of view uh, i wasn't able to get working okay but 
for someone who would write that test themselves, like manually, it's pretty straightforward. You can do it in Delphi, in VB.net, in C Sharp, in whatever you want. They've got, like, they have language plugins. Okay. And, uh, that was pretty straightforward. It looks a lot like Segway Silk Test. Okay. Segway Silk Test is way more expensive. It's $5,000 plus. Segway Silk Test is, is pretty hardcore. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, if you need to ask how much it is, then you probably don't need it. Right. Because I went up on their site, and we, we own Silk Test here at Carillion. Uh, I went up on their site and looked at how much uh, it cost, and it said, if you'd like to buy, give us a call, and we'll t- hook you up with one of our sales professionals. Now, is that Mercury? Okay, so Mercury Windrunner is from, I believe it's from Rational, and that's another tool. That's and something else. That's something else from shrinkster.com slash CYC. These are the kind of the Bentley and Mercedes of testing tools, where an enterprise decides that they're going to standardize on this at that, you know, several tens of thousands of dollars as an enterprise. Okay. Silk test is kind of like has a Pascal like language called Fortest, while the automated QA guys give you the choice of like five different languages. And you can pick up Segway Silk Test at uh, shrinkster.com slash C Y L. I think you said that both of these programs are very expensive. Well, I would say that Silk, yeah, Silk Test and Mer- Mercury are definitely in the several grand per person okay. kind of a world. So if you're looking at like a win, win runner, or if you're looking at Segway Silk Test, uh, take a look at Automated QA's Test Complete. You're going to get very, very similar uh, benefits for probably half or a fifth of the cost. Yeah, it looks like a fifth. a lot cheaper. Yeah. Even at their most expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So the the the, the commitment to this to to any testing product, right, is that you're going to basically put all of the, your eggs in this this testing product's basket. Uh, one of the things I liked about the test complete is that they'll call in unit tests. They'll use some of the existing resources that you have. So if you had a really complicated application that had both WinForms and web uh, UI, mm-hmm. that would be the kind of thing you'd want to look at. Cool. So other web testing tools that are uh, way cheaper, and as such, of course, you get a lot less um, benefits. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one's called SW Explorer Automation from Alex Furman, and that's at shrinkster.com slash C-Y-E. This is a tool that we kind of back go back and forth here at Carillion about. I'm personally a Water fan, W A T I R, Web Application Testing in Ruby. We'll talk right. about that in a second. But uh, one of our QA leads here, uh, Brent Strange, is a fan of the SW Explorer automation because it generates, in some way, uh, C sharp code mm. or VB.NET code. In some way, what do you mean by that? Okay, so this is an interesting, an interesting tool. He he's got a recorder, right? So you you Go into his application, you say record, and then he watches you actually click on the page. But what you do is you call, you create what's called a scene. So you say, on this page, I am interested in these things. Because on, on a particular page, you may not be interested in every aspect of the, the page, just a right. few controls. Sure. So you right click on the controls and you say, I want this, this, and this in my scene. So yeah. you set up these scenes and then you can refer to them in the scene as, uh, like a simpler name than than what they were. Okay. And then he saves out these scene files in a form of an XML file. This XML file internally has an X path that basically plucks that control out. So when you were clicking on the control and setting the scene, he was keeping track of this depth, this path within your um, HTML application. Cool. Um, and then when you generate the code, he gives you a collection of these objects that you were interested in the scene, and then you just pull them out of a hash table. Okay. So good things about that is, yeah, it's pretty straightforward to use. It's easy to record. Bad things are that if he does tie your testing code a little bit to your um, site's structure. Yeah. So if you move something around, if a button comes out of a text box, you have to go back and and then reset the stage, basically. Go re-record the scene. You don't have to re-record your scripts you just have to change this mapping file. That's one of the things uh, I like about Visual Studio that we sometimes take for granted is how it, how, how it, especially 2005, how it remembers things and changes things when you change them. Yeah, it would be nice if there was a better, more deterministic way for him to find these controls. Yeah. But but what he's doing is very clever. I mean, he, he grabs what you're doing in IE and he creates these mapping tools and then that makes your scripts very simple. Mm-hmm. So you don't spend time in your script digging around for controls. Mm-hmm. You spend the time doing what you want to do. Um, 
but again, tying it to the structure of the underlying document seemed a little, uh, a little interesting. When I said that he generates this code, kind of, what he's generating is C-sharp code that calls his underlying automation stuff. So he's not generating C-sharp code that talks to IE. He'll generate code that calls SW Explorer Automation dot navigate. I see. Rather than IE dot navigate. But then once you're in there, you just say things like scene, and then you pull out the object that you want. Um, interestingly, also, rather than picking existing objects like HTML text area from ASP or pulling them out of IE or any of the other places that have defined these, he's got his own controls collection. So he really has a complete wrapper around IE, and mm-hmm. then he'll generate this code for you that uh, to modify, and you can poke around within his his object model on top of IE. That's very cool. And that's up at uh, shrinkster.com slash CYE, and that's $59. Um, pretty interesting. Uh, mostly a recorder, but he gives you a pretty rich object model. So with any recorder, you're not going to do your complete testing only in the recorder, right? The yeah. recorder is just going to get you 80% of the way there, and right. you're going to jumpstart your, yep. your testing. Okay. So stepping over to a competitor, there's one called Bad Boy at shrinkster.com slash C-Y-J. This is an Australian company that has a very similar product that does recording as well. SWE Explorer Automation will put IE on a string and basically launch that process and then tile your windows so he's on the left and IE is on the right. Oh, cool. Bad Boy will put the browser inside, and this is a real e- easy way to do your automation. Basically, oh, cool. He's cool. sticking the... IE user control inside. Now, ba- yeah, Bad Boy is kind of a, uh, it's free, uh, but it, it's, it kind of walks the line between an HTTP recorder and an object model recorder. He's watching the traffic as you move around and keeping track of requests and sub requests mm-hmm. and then parameterizing them. So then you can go back in and say, well, I like that request, except this sub request here where I called out to this iframe. Mm. I don't want to do that anymore. Mm. Or I want to change this. And then he'll keep track of all the assertions, the warnings, the timings. He does lots of charting and graphing. Um, you know, for a free tool, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. Now, a, a, a very similar tool that has a little more functionality, uh, in my opinion, is from the guys at mjtnet.com. Uh, they've got a tool called Web Recorder, shrinkster.com slash CYK. And this is a showcase recorder that's actually separated from their playback. So basically, you the recorder creates scripts in their scripting kind of VB language that then is run through their macro recorder. So they have a generic macro recorder can do, that can do other things. Hmm. It appears the MJT net guys are not just going for the testing market, but also the automation market. If you're hmm. someone who wants to s- do screen scraping, hmm. you could use their tool to, to suck data off of the net. Now, one of the things that's really cool is that they've taken uh, that idea, like the water maker that I did a while back, which was a, a recorder, a poor man's recorder that would basically make water scripts. Right. They took their recorder technology and out of the kindness of their hearts, released a water web recorder at shrinkster.com slash CYD. This uses their web recorder technology, but records Ruby hmm. water scripts for you, gets you jump started on, on water and is really already much more, um, much more functional than now, my existing tool. Now I know you've talked about Ruby quite a few times now and what, you know, what's, what's so great about Ruby that C sharp can't do or VBnet can't do. What is so cool about it? It's, it's hard, hard to express. It's so, it's so elegant and um, elegant and not in a C in a C, C or C++ kind of terse way. Like some people will look at C and they'll say, wow, that's really elegant. It's so terse. Ruby has that kind of feel of VB in the sense that it's not hiding meaning in symbols like C Sharp does or C++ does. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's avoiding unnecessary... Um, it's it's avoiding unnecessary uh, words. I guess it's kind of hard to say. It's like when you hear someone like um like if you read if you read Hemingway, you sure. go, "Wow, that was a really tight sentence. He yeah. just said it all, and I really can't like see how I'm struggling right now to say yeah, yeah. this correctly." <laughs> that's that's kind of what Ruby is like. It's all right. So a, it's succinct. It's, maybe it's what yeah. You would it's say. succinct. It's smooth. It's elegant. It's no, it, it feels lightweight. Now, do you it, like this for just scripting, or do you like? Would you like to see this as a as a 
you know, the the next language, the next big language. I mean, for oh, everything. Yeah, I think, well, no, I think it may be the next big language. Like I pointed to John Lamb's blog. Right. And how he's building that Ruby CLR bridge. Definitely Ruby is going to be around for for a while. I think it'll it'll fill a place like Python did. And is it, a, what I'm getting at is, do you think it's going to be a good general language or is it going to be specific to web or Windows apps or any particular kind of apps? I think that because Ruby on Rails, their their web base, basically the ASP.NET of Ruby is called Rails. Yeah. So Ruby is Ruby. It's a scripting language and you can do whatever you want to with it. You can write command line applications. Uh, Ruby on Rails lets you do things like object relational mapping and object persistence in really very elegant ways. You can write a blog and, you know, 20,000 lines of code, that so, kind of thing. So your answer is, <laughs> you still have it. Is it general? I, I guess that's what I'm asking. I mean, I don't have to tell you, man. It's general until it's not general. All you know, right. C sharp, general. Okay. Yeah, it, it is. C sharp is general to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's general in that, yes, you can do anything you want to with it. Yeah. Yeah. No one's, no one said, Oh, wow. I totally couldn't do that in Ruby. Okay. And, and you think more VB programmers or C sharp programmers would like Ruby? I mean, who does it, who does it you feel know, better to? That's a to? very good point. Just like I was saying before that it, it has a, a, a VB style about it in that it doesn't use a whole lot of funky symbols. Yeah. But, it has all the kind of powerful OO as well as some things hmm. that, that C Sharp doesn't quite do yet. Okay. So I think that it's a really good compromise. I mean, if C Sharp programmers and VB.net programmers could really bury the hatchet, they would do it over a language like Ruby. Okay. Enough yeah, of it, that. Let's, it's, we'll, it's, let's move on. Well, and this actually <laughs> moves us on to a nice place, which is to the, wa to water. Okay. So water, web, web application testing in Ruby is basically an IE wrapper. It's a wrapper around Internet Explorer's COM interface that okay. lets Ruby talk to IE in a very clean and, and elegant way. And it's I like it because you can literally just sit down and start working and you're productive immediately. I like it because you can show someone something in, in Ruby and water and say, oh, it's like this. And they'll go, oh, wow. And you don't even need to teach them the language. Anyone who knows how to code at all goes oh okay here's how you do an if mm. you know so literally you sit down and you go ie dot new ie dot go to equal you know and that, that's like how you do it okay ie dot text field and you grab a text field and you go dot set value and then you're moving yourself along it's that it's that easy okay so uh for really simple functional testing that you want to just work you want it to be free and you're willing to learn another language it's cool Sure. Could you use uh, C Sharp for this? Absolutely. You could use VB.net. You could go into Visual Studio. You could say add web reference and start poking around at IE. Okay. Except the IE DOM, right, the document object model for IE is complicated. Yes. And you find yourself poking around documents.all.forms. Blah, 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 blah. Right. right? With, with water, they've basically flattened, when appropriate, the DOM. So you hmm. can go ie.text field, and then this is the cool part. You can say, I want this text field by name, yeah. or I want it by, by index. It's that's the fifth cool. one, or that, by whatever, you know. That's cool. You don't always, you know, you can't always remember where the higher, what the hierarchy is, and seldom does it matter. Yeah. And, and the other nice thing is that because Ruby has regular expressions just as a construct there all the time, you can just pass in a regular expression into water and say, give me the one that ends with foo. Right. And it'll just figure it out. And ordinarily, you'd be writing code in C Sharp or VB.net to run around looking for that thing. They've, they've hidden all that for you. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the cool part because people always say, oh, well, that's IE only, right? Yeah. Well, there's some, there's some rumblings going on. And, uh, with all cool named products like Water, W A T I R, there are cool named sub projects. There's a thing called Firewater. <laughs> Coming soon. You can see that one coming down Broadway. Yeah. Uh, shrinkster.com <laughs> slash CYF. And then here's a little known secret in that you won't find it on Google yet. Uh, shrinkster.com slash CYG. This is the actual, uh, subversion repository. And I've sent you the link to the specific Firefox point zero one All branch right. within the water repository. So, so let's back up. Water, fire water is Firefox water. Right. Yeah, so what they've done is, is so clever. He's built a Firefox extension that then Ruby will call. Wow. 
but you but but you would just keep using uh water the way you're comfortable with using water i see it's 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 i'm sure it's going to be very cool and once you have a nice tight recorder which i think that we are getting there with uh, shrinkster.com slash cyd the water web recorder which jump starts things and i want to make make it clear that the the water team is not a fan of recorders yeah they've, okay. they've said that publicly I, I like recorders because they jumpstart the work, but understand that they'll get you 80%. You have to stop, hit save, and then edit from there mm-hmm. afterwards. Um, but, and then if you've got cross browser support, at least on IE and, and Firefox, you've got a really nice tool. Okay. Um, and then of course, Travis Illig and Dustin Woodhouse, both of my uh, buddies here at Carillion have written wrappers around uh, water to allow NUnit to talk to those things. Okay. And uh, if you can check my blog for those things. So those those are the fr- that's that's free. Water's free. And again, it is free like a puppy, right? Sure. So there you know, our guys here, they struggle with it sometimes. They start getting into, well, I seem to be copy pasting code a lot. How can I use OO to solve that problem? You know, these are the kinds of things that you just have to stumble with and that's the the hidden cost. Now, what is Pestercat? So Pestercat is a Java based proxy based tool for for $27 at shrinkster.com slash cyb that will do web testing and uh, it will work on OS X, Mac, Windows, mm-hmm. or Linux. Hmm. And also has a toolkit that will let you plug it into Ant, which is the uh like you were used you're familiar with Ant. Yeah. This is Ant on the uh, uh automated uh, builds. Automated builds, exactly. Yeah. And this is another really nice tool that will also do not just uh, gets and posts and things like that, but also um, regex validation of gets and posts. So you mm-hmm. can put your asserts in like that, as well as some uh, some SQL type stuff. So if you're a LAMP type individual, right? Mm-hmm. If you're Linux, Apache, MySQL, Perl, uh, then LAMP, yeah, LAMP, right? The LAMP stack, right? Then something like Pestercat would be a really uh, straightforward thing that you'd be familiar with right away. But then I would ask you to look at at Ruby because that's something that works uh, cross platform. Although Water is still specifically Windows. Okay. So Water is still Windows because it's talking to the IE stuff. But you know the the potential for Ruby to really become a great general scripting language is going to be pretty powerful. Okay. So IE specific uh, seems to be kind of the the way things go because the object model on top of IE is so nice. Right. And the, the flexibility is there. Uh, there's another tool called IE unit, shrinkster.com slash CYA, uh, which is not just about the JavaScript object model, but also takes advantage of, uh, cscript.exe, right? The script runner that comes with, um, with Windows. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's, it's in, implemented entirely in JavaScript, but it is tailored specifically to Windows. So it's using the IE DHTML model hmm. Hmm. so it's it's poking at the browser using the browser's you know using jscript.dll the javascript engine so the installation is trivial it's just you know x copy deploy and it allows you also to use all the new javascript object oriented stuff to extend it yeah um I, I, I this is a pretty cool tool and i looked at this before we started getting into water but i haven't seen anything moving on this since october of last year hmm. and i really like the idea of Whatever testing tool I'm going to buy, I want to know that it's, it's being actively thought about, it's being worked on, and that people care about it. Right. So I'm not really clear if iUnit is paused or or what's going on there. Still, uh, something interesting to watch. And if you're going to be, if you like JavaScript and you're not interested in learning something like Ruby, then definitely something that you might want to take a look at. Okay. Now, on the JavaScript side, Selenium is the one that people always compare to Ruby. Not because it has anything to do with Ruby or looks anything like Ruby, but when people say, I want a free functional web-based tool for testing, yeah, and I want it to be easy, Selenium is just about as easy as it could get, but it's really, for the average Windows guy, uh, presumably you and I are the average Windows guys, uh, it's really weird. Hmm. The input into them, the input that you would say, How, what do you write your test in, is HTML tables. Huh? You write your tests as HTML tables. So you would make like a table, like in any HTML editor, you could write it in, you know, Mozilla Composer or front page, and you'd have three columns. And then the first column, you'd say open. Second column, you'd say the page you want to open. 
Hmm. And then the third column would be for other parameters you'd pass in. Open only has the one. So then on the next line, the next row in the table, you might say something like verify text present. Hmm. So that left column, that first column, are the functions you're going to be calling in the in the toolkit. So you're saying like hmm. open this to you know open Franklin's.net, next line, verify element present, Carl Franklin, or whatever, verify text present, and then you could say click and wait, verify location. All these kinds of verbs appear in that left side, and then the hmm. other two columns become input. Now, what's cool about this is that non-technical people can do this. Okay. And you might, oh, like HTML uh, tables. Well, yeah. Right? They could open it up. You could give this to your business guy. He could open it up in the front page. Yeah. And you could just say, well, here's a list of things that you could do. And you just basically give them a text file that says, here's what you can do. Make a table. Make a table and write the things in the order that you want. Okay. Then when they run them, the the running actually occurs in the browser. So the browser's doing the work. So hmm. open up a browser and go to that URL that I just sent you. This is a, a really interesting tool. The test runner you can see at shrinkster.com slash CYN. And then on the right side there, it says execute test. This is all running in the browser. Just say, you know, run all. You can also walk through them. And you'll watch that it's actually using JavaScript to look at those tables and then do the work, and it's running your site in a frame below. Now, there's a there's a test demo here that uh, we could shrinksterize and tell people about. So again, you can take a look at the demo of that at shrinkster.com slash cyn, and look at the homepage for Selenium at shrinkster.com slash cy9. Okay, cool. Now, I you know I got to tell you, I go back and forth because there's some really neat stuff you can do in Ruby, some very specific kinds of testing, but for really simple kind of acceptance testing. Uh, if you didn't have enough testers, but you had a lot of, you know, uh, business people who know what they want mm. and, and, and could be given some kind of test philosophy, yeah. there's really something to be said for Selenium. Now, okay. because it's written entirely in JavaScript, it really works anywhere. But you can't do uh, – like I couldn't write a test for Google.com because I don't own their domain. Oh. So you do have to install this on your server side ah. and then – because you don't want it, because the JavaScript has to come from the same location as with the thing you're going to test. That's right. Otherwise, you've got some cross-browser things. But there's also um, Selenium drivers being written. So there's two ways you can do this. It can run in the browser, or it could be driven by Ruby or C Sharp or whatever kind of driver application is currently being being used. Okay. But like I'm running this right now inside of um, Firefox, and it's it's pretty pretty amazing. If you're not doing functional testing. Sit down and write one of these. Write one of these tests and get it working on maybe your blog or something simple. And I really think that you'll uh, you'll be amazed at how how simple functional testing has really become. No. And then I'm sorry. Another thing I wanted to point out was that sure. a really great guide to why Ruby is cool is at <laughs> shrinkster.com/slash/cym. It's called Poignant's Guide to Ruby. It's a okay. weird little cartoony. He's got like cartoon foxes and stuff, so it's kind of obscure. But uh, download the PDF and read it, and it'll tell you why he thinks... It's kind of like Rory wrote it. If Rory wrote a guideline <laughs> on Ruby, it would be this guy's poignant guide to Ruby. It's okay. pretty cool stuff. Good. And and um, now, Visual Studio Team System has some testing stuff built into it as well. It does. I haven't looked at the, any of the, the, the testing stuff short of how it does unit testing. Right, like, okay. Like, you know, it's a, as a, you know, a Visual Studio Team System as a replacement for NUnit. Okay. Um, have you looked at it? Does it do web-based no, testing? No, I, I, I haven't. I mean, I, last I interviewed somebody, um, when when I talked to the team, they said it did have a web testing tool, but there wasn't a Windows testing tool. So is it a is it a Visual Studio Team System load testing tool? Does it yeah, do I haven't test I load? haven't used it myself, but uh, but from what I understand, it's a it's a web testing tool, and that's about all I know. See so here, we'll here we'll put it out into the world. And yeah, that's right. They'll, they'll tell us no. I suspect it's probably the application center test. On steroids? Probably. probably. But I, I don't know if it's functional web testing. I, I have not seen that. If I had, I probably would be using it. We'll leave it up to an alert listener to send us uh, the skinny on that. We can talk about it next week. Absolutely. Um, so there's another product out there, Scott, uh, by Redgate called Ants. Does that fall into the category of uh, web testing? So there's Ants Load. Uh, the Redgate software has got an, a series of products called the Ants Profiler, Ants Load. Ants Load is a load testing application. So like using Segway, there's like Segway Silk Performer and Segway Silk Test. Mm -hmm. Those are calling out a functional test tool versus a uh, 
a load testing tool. Okay. Uh, Ants load is more of a, I want to beat on that web server as hard as I can and see if the application falls over. I see. Okay. Good. So they really don't belong in, in the functional testing yeah, category. Yeah. If, if, if today what we're talking about is, is uh, functional testing, then no. Okay. That's a, that's a pretty good wrap up there, Scott. Yeah. It's a, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there and, you know, varying in prices from, uh, you know, get a second mortgage to free and waste a lot of time. Uh, we found at Carillion a nice balance, uh, for our large load testing. We use Segway and we paid a lot for it. And, uh, for our functional testing, we use, um, water and we continue to watch Selenium. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out what I want to use to test DOS blog. I know that we need a unit testing framework and it's going to be probably because we're an open source project and we're free, either Selenium or, um, or water. And it sounds like if you want to test Windows applications, you really ought to look at test complete. Yeah, automated uh, QA is test complete for for WinForms application, for Windows apps, any kind of existing COM application, pretty hardcore. You could also look at uh, the stuff from from Mercury or, yep. or from Segway, but I think you're going to spend a lot more money. Right. Okay, good. So what else besides testing has been on your mind this week, Scott? Well, uh, people keep sending me links to Orb.com. It's this... Uh, Home entertainment application, not quite media center, wants to be media center thing. Yeah. Uh, it seems to be that kind of the, the meme that's moving around the net right now. Like, hey, Warp's cool. People trying to do remote TV. And, you know, we need to do a talk on, uh, we'll do it, we'll do a talk. Let's do this. Let's do a show on poor man's media centers because okay. there are at least a dozen. And it's like any excuse to not use Windows Media Center. People right. will come up with a way. There's Java-based tools, and there's there's Beyond TV from Snapstream, and there. I feel like I know more about those things just from listening to you talk on the previous shows than than uh, than I've ever wanted to know. Yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, frankly, I I spent years trying to figure out what I was going to use to record TV. A large part of my life will never be gotten back because I spent time screwing around with the ATI all in Blender, mm. trying to get it to work on my on my system. Uh, mm. I've got a uh uh. See, I was gonna, you know, I was gonna say hophog, but I remembered last time that uh, someone told me it was pronounced hophog. Whatever. The hophog card that I've got, my fifty dollars cheapo card. It was yeah. fifty bucks. I can pronounce it how I want to. Um, the hophog card that I've got just plugs right into Beyond TV. Yeah. Which is really inexpensive. Now people are saying to look at Orb because it does transcoding. So basically, I could be at a hotel, log into my machine at home by punching a hole in the firewall, and it yeah. will transcode my. Uh, my shows and send them to me. Yeah. Interestingly, though, and both, stream them right. And I mean, stream it's not them just downloading. So, yeah. So it'll basically say, well, uh, yeah, I've got a giant file. It's two gigs, but I've got low bandwidth here. Stream it to me at two fifty six k. Yeah. Uh, and Orb does that, and people are excited about it because apparently it's easy to set up. But Beyond TV has done that for a couple of years. I've been I've been going to hotels on on trips, going to TechEd, and watching TV via my Beyond TV or Beyond TV link stuff from Snapstream. So maybe a listener can tell me why Orb is cooler than that, or maybe they didn't realize that Beyond TV already does that. Okay. So that was that, that was an interesting thing, though. But people keep saying, take a look at Orb, take a look at Orb. It also seems like if you put Orb on a Media Center PC, Orb does the recording and the Media Center P doesn't. Huh. And that seemed a little disturbing to me. It was cool that Orb would create files in the Media Center PC format, but I don't know what I think about having another service that's not the media center doing the uh, the recording for me. How's that different from Slingbox? Okay, so so Slingbox, uh, if I understand correctly, just looks at your media and quote unquote slings it around. It is basically a a hardware transcoder. I see. It's a piece of hardware that will f- that will throw your stuff around to wherever you want. And from what I understand with Slingbox, it's not like. It plugs in and you can have multiple people's, you know, stealing cable off your box. Basically, you have to, no, nobody can watch another channel while you're watching it remotely. In other words, it's a re- definitely a single user remote uh, viewer for your whatever's coming off your cable box. Yeah, well, Slingbox apparently supports DVR, satellite boxes, DVDs. I mean, it is a, it's, it's less about being a PC and Slingbox is more about, uh, capturing. I see. Your existing, uh, media, not your media center, but your existing entertainment centers. Whatever that is. Content and storing it off somewhere so then you can look at it elsewhere. Okay. So I think Slingbox would be the kind of thing that I would recommend to my dad. Yeah. Because it would plug in, it would work, he wouldn't have to think about it. It is an appliance. Okay. While all of these different tools that we'll talk about in, uh, in a future show about media center PCs all require a PC. I don't get the impression that 
that other than the sling player, which is the thing that you would use to watch your shows, yeah. you don't require a whole system to use a sling box. On that future show, perhaps we should wait till something really cool comes out. Yeah, uh, I need to get myself a, a one of these high-def TiVos that you're talking about, the six tuners or something. Yeah, right. And apparently Sony's also got a an very expensive and complicated thing called location-free TV. Hmm. I noticed that when I recently upgraded my PSP, my PlayStation Portable, I now have built-in location-free TV. So this is kind of Sony's sling box. Okay. Uh, except it's – and they've got it up at Fry's and people walk past it and don't care. Got a URL for that? Yeah, that is up at – Shrinkster.com slash CYH. This is a Sony kind of a sling box. And then they, they've got pictures on their little flash demo of people holding not quite origami looking devices and All right. s- sitting in their lounge chairs watching television. I see. And, uh, and of course, with your PSP, you'd be able to watch it as well. Personally, I'd much rather avoid streaming this stuff around and I would just copy it to my PSP and watch it anywhere I want to. Yeah, really. What ha- what's now the DVD media are so cheap, you know, now that become you know, lower class or, you know, t- you know, too lowbrow for us. Well, this is the thing, you know, I was explaining <laughs> I was explaining to my 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 80-year-old uncle the concept of sneaker net because he's got a dial-up connection and I wanted to back up his computer. So I went over there this weekend with a uh I was going to take over a like a USB key but I didn't have one, right. so I took my camera. I took my camera with two gigs. I plugged uh-huh. in my digital camera, and I backed up his whole computer. <laughs> and Great. I said, "I said, what am I?" He said, "What are you doing here? You know, why couldn't I just email it to you?" And I said, <laughs> "Well, you know, it's FedEx is faster than yeah. your dial-up. You know, I could overnight this thing, and it would come to me faster than you could upload it." Yeah. So I was saying, well. It's great that we have location-free TV and we're streaming media around and whatnot, but it's just as easy if I really want to watch the show to burn it to a DVD and put it in my bag. Right. How many times have you gotten to a hotel and they have a crap connection? All right, I know. Or you know, you can't count on the wireless at um, yeah, at true. Starbucks to get you the the Winter Olympics. I'm just going to burn them to a disc and I'll take them with me. Yep, exactly. So there's something to be said for SneakerNet. I agree. So uh, what, what's you got one more thing on the list here that you want to talk about? Halo Zero. Oh, this is the coolest, man! I love this. This is a 2D side scroller, quote unquote, port of Halo. So it's a side scroller Halo. It's like remember, like you ever played Contra or you know R Type, those kind of like classic three twenty by two forty oh, yeah. big pixel. Yeah. This is absolutely fantastic. It's at trinkster dot com slash c y i. And it is brilliant. You might have to struggle with the download. It's a, it's very popular. All right. So let me let me ask. Did they start with the actual Halo environment? No. Or no. is it completely redone? This is a this is just a as if Halo is a comic book. All right. So it's brand new. They didn't use any of the bits from Halo. No. 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 This is this is an uh, this is an homage. I got gotcha. you. To be to be French, uh, yeah. of what they're doing. It's, That's it's, cool. It's fantastic. Here's the link. Take a look at that, Carl. It it reminds me a lot of like Contra or you know Super Mario. It's got that kind of classic crisp 2D shaded 2D sprite style. It's a blast to play. They use the same heads up display as Halo. Yeah. And the the graphics are really very nice. Uh, it's it's a really fun game, and I don't know why it's uh, why it's free. I love those horizontal play. Oh yeah, games. they've even got a level editor now, so you can you can make your own levels. <laughs> that's great. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> so, Scott, that uh, I guess that's a show. What are we going to talk about next week? I think next week we're going to talk about the new Microsoft Command Shell, uh, codename Monad. Oh, cool. Uh, this is like the new DOS prompt for, for Windows, and I am absolutely loving it. I'm in love with this thing. Kevin Hill turned me on to this thing. I had looked at it before. I'd said, eh, this is too complicated. And then one day I needed it. And I started poking around, and it is absolutely fantastic. All right. Uh, it's it's the way that we're going, and you got to check it out. And then I think maybe the week after that, we'll talk about a little bit more about micro formats. Hmm. Uh, okay. Micro formats are, well, that'll be a show then, won't it? So I, I won't yeah. even start. <laughs> <laughs> we just won't even start. All right, Scott, thanks a lot. And thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week on Handsome Minutes. <laughs>